Imperial Brand CEO Allison Cooper, thank you for joining me. Pleasure. Let's start with the earnings. A lot of this was focused on these uh, tobacco alternatives, cigarette alternatives, next generation products. We did see tobacco volumes uh, slightly softer in terms of what estimates we're looking for. Tobacco volumes in the U.S. are um, under unprecedented pressure. Do you see yourself as a tobacco company selling cigarettes, or are you more of an innovator looking for the next way to deliver a hit of nicotine? We've got really two growth engines that we're focused on at the moment, and one is absolutely the tobacco side of the business. And there were a few things in the results around some shipment timings that, that actually um, cover up the fact that there were some very good performances there from tobacco overall in the first half. And, and all the investments we've been doing over the last few years are really working for us on the tobacco side. Um, so yes, we've got some good underlying momentum in terms of the top line in tobacco. Um, we've got the right brands performing for us in tobacco, and also the profitability is coming through strongly, which is funding returns, but also funding investment in, in next generation products. And the next generation side for us is really additive for us. And so that's our second engine that we're very much focused on. Blue has been the story of the first half, you know, 250% growth nearly, um, like for like um, revenue growth. Um, so really, really coming through strongly for us. So it's a very important focus for us, huge priority for us. And it's additive. Um, and you can see that coming through strongly in the Americas and Europe with 4% um, revenue growth in both of those regions and 2.5% overall. So it's the combination of the two. In the U.S., you flagged a slowdown in vaping. Do you think there's signs of improvement there? Yes, yes. The first quarter was where we saw most of the slowdown in the category. The category is coming back into growth again, and I still see that as a very important opportunity for us in the U.S. Um, that's combined with our cigarette business, where we were growing share for the first time since we, um, since we did the big deal um, a few years ago, which is great with the portfolio, mass market cigars as well. So the whole, whole portfolio for us is working in that market, but yes, Blue continues to be, vape continues to be a huge opportunity in that market. Philip Morris in the U.S. just got the green light to sell these um, heat-to-burn products, ICOS it's called. What are you doing to face like that competition you're seeing in the States? So from a heated tobacco perspective, it's early days. Good to see the FDA approving um, because I think that gives us a very clear clear route in terms of getting vapor products approved. When so you we, when welcome we need to. this Philip Morris move? We, we do, we do. I think ICOS appeals to certain consumers um, with certain demographics and we can see um, some opportunity for the product in the market, but I do think in the US it's very much a vaping market and that's going to continue to be the feature in the, in the US market and that's our focus. But we have a heated tobacco product that we just launched. The too. Pulse, right? Yes. And that just launched this week, the yes. first time in Japan. Yes, in Japan. The test launch in Japan, um, it's not been our priority, but we have wanted to develop optionality in this space and I think we've got a great product that we're launching in, in Japan, so I'm looking forward to seeing the results. Where would be next for this type of product? I mean, can you see it doing well outside of Asia? Because I know these heated tobacco products are really big in Asia, while vaping is kind of bigger everywhere else. Like, could it work in the US or Europe? There are definitely other pockets of, um, of, of growth from an ICOS perspective um, in East and Central Europe that we've seen as well. So there may be some opportunities there over time. But for now, we're just focused on the Japan launch and really vaping in our, in our priority markets. These next generation products, I like to think of the next generation vice products almost. They sometimes don't have to go through the same advertising restrictions in some countries. Do you see this as a way you can leverage how you you know, market and even educate people about like these new products big tobacco, big tobacco companies have? Yeah, it varies by market, but a lot of NGP products, and especially the ones that don't contain tobacco, i.e. vaping, um, do have less restrictions in terms of, 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 of advertising. You can, you've got more opportunities to communicate with the smoker um, about the product and therefore get them to think about transitioning um, to, to a vape product. Um, so yes, there are some more freedoms in certain markets and we've leveraged some of that, but also leveraged clearly our strong retail um, relationships as well in Europe in particular to, to get My Blue launch, for example, in the first half. Um, and also now we, we've got number one positions in retail in most of those markets. So it's a very, been a very good performance for us. I want to ask you about cannabis. Last year you invested in Oxford Cannaboy Technologies actually alongside a venture firm that's backed by Snoop Dogg. They were in that round with you as well. Now, this firm, Oxford Cannaboy Technologies, is targeting big pharma for funding. Do you see potential in offering next generation smoking devices as medical devices? We haven't, we haven't landed on an opportunity yet in, in, this, in this space. We're exploring significantly. 
um, and no doubt Oxford cannabinoid technologies have been great for learning more about the science, which is important to us, um, but also actually just interacting with thought leaders in this space, um, which is really good for our understanding and evaluation of the space as well. And if I look at Imperial's capabilities, if I look at the technologies that we have as well, you know, there's something there to explore um, and to really think about for us. You once described it as in between, you could see yourselves maybe in between this recreational use and medical use, something like wellness. Do you think that's the case where you, that's where you can really make your mark? I mean, I was just telling you, I was in Los Angeles two weekends ago, and some of these dispensaries even look like, they remind me of Apple stores. You know, if you want to feel less anxious, you want to go to sleep, this is the kind of, you know, cannabis pen for you. Is that where you think big tobacco can make its mark? Because it's billions of dollars, this industry. Yeah, you're right. There's a whole spectrum of, um, of use of cannabis where it's really getting developed in different markets. And that ranges from the pharma side of it through wellness, through, through, to, to, through, to, through to recreational. And there's no doubt if you look at the, the, the demographics and the developments that the whole wellness um, interest, and I'm not just talking cannabis here, but generally um, is, is growing um, in, in the population. Um, but, but for us, I think the lifestyle products is where, where we're focused. Um, and I think you know, any decision that we did make in this space, I said we were just exploring it currently, would be very much around those, those lifestyle um, type, type brands and products and experiences. It was for an undisclosed amount of money that you invested in, but do you think you could see yourself investing more money into either Oxford Cannaboid or another type of um, medical cannabis company? We're just exploring for now, um, but, but, but clearly we will, we will keep evaluating. Um, you also said last week, I want to ask you about the cigar business. You said you're going to sell this premium cigar business. How long do you expect this process to take place? Could it close out this year? You know, what are the prospects for that? Yeah, we, we've been working on a number of opportunities and, and there's been a lot of work going on um, around the, the overall divestment program. Um, and particularly in relation to premium cigars, um, we are looking to move that ahead. I think these processes are always difficult to predict in terms of how long they take. Um, they're quite complex. Um, but we are clearly looking to, to realise um, you know, up to two billion, um, which is across the whole divestment programme by this time next year. That's still very much on, on track. Who do you think is interested in it? Is it like maybe a luxury company or private equity? Because we do see a lot of tobacco companies invest like you are in these next generation products. Um, where do you think this could go? I think just simplest at this point in time, because I don't want to compromise anything with the process, it's a very interesting asset. Um, it's got some great iconic brands. Um, I think there's going to be broad interest in it. OK, so a variety potentially of interest, not your traditional. Um, and finally, I just wanted to ask you a question on gender diversity. You are one of five now of FTSE 100 CEOs. That's a woman. Um, actually, the number has gotten less. I think it used to be seven, nine. Um, why do you think? That's so. Uh, why aren't we seeing more women at the top of companies and, and leading? I, I think it links to something I've probably commented on historically, which is, you know, that there's not a quick fix to this. It's going to take time to, to, to bring people through businesses, um, to, to develop them through businesses. And I think we are seeing improvements as we work through the management layers. I know of corporates, there's a lot of focus, a lot of effort. You know, we've got a, a significant focus on diversity and inclusion in Imperial to really try and, and to try and improve, um, and, and particularly the, the lower levels of the organization. I'm not talking, you know, we've got, some, we've got some, some better performances, but we do need to, to move that up through the business. And we'll do, we, we are doing that, but I do think it does take time to do. Um, and I think there's no doubt that there's a number of women making different choices as well. Um, as they get more senior, they've got opportunities, uh, and uh, maybe you know, the corporate world isn't always where they want to, want to stay either. I think it's an environment point there we need to think about too. Um, but, but also, I have to say in Imperial, we're focused on the broadest um, definition of diversity. Gender is clearly important, um, but actually we need to look at diversity more generally in, in the business too, and, and we very much are. As a FTSE 100 CEO, do you think there'll be, you know, when do you think we'll see maybe half and half? I think that's a way out, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully sooner. Mm. No. I, I, it's got to be worked on, but it's going to be some time yet, I think.